Okay, I'm gonna start the, I'm gonna click the go live. Yeah, we got about a minute here and then we'll yeah. get started. So. Yeah, the classic automatic, except you have to push this button setting, which yeah. you can actually adjust that setting. So it is just pure automatic, but I always worry I'm gonna accidentally stream the wrong stream to the wrong YouTube channel if I do that. <laughs> And Dave, I don't know whether you meant to put the live stream link just for the... Just for us, because okay. someone might click it and accidentally get a weird echo. Yeah, we don't want that. So. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah. Well, like they're here, and so they don't need the to time. go see the live stream. So. Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah, we wanted to send something to Colby's family so they could uh, check him out, too. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and get started here. And so hello, everyone, and welcome to the April NASA Night Sky Network member webinar. We're hosting tonight's webinar from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California. We're very excited to present this webinar with our guest speaker, Colby Osberg from the University of California at Riverside. Welcome to everyone joining us on the live stream on YouTube. We're very happy to have you with us. These webinars are monthly events for members of the Night Sky Network. And for more information about the Night Sky Network and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, in just a moment, we'll put a couple of links in the chat. But before we introduce Colby, here's Dave Prosper with just a couple of announcements. Okay, hi folks. Uh, right off, I just wanna thank you all for joining us today. Um, let's see here. And uh, my apologies if you're watching this on a recording um, that you did not get my reminder email. Spent most of the day trying to get our system to send everyone a reminder and obviously it didn't work in time, but thankfully it's a bug that only affects super users like myself. Uh, and co coordinators, you're fine. Club members, you're fine. Um, my apologies again. Let me fix very soon. Uh, and more fun news, we're going to be at the NCRAL Vision 2022, the convention for the North Central Regional Astronomical League's convention, the convention convention, this May 13th and 14th. So if you're near the Port Washington, Wisconsin area, and for those of you not near that area, it's also pretty near the greater Milwaukee area, uh, stop on by and say hi. Uh, there's going to be a ton of great speakers and great company there. And I'm going to put the link in the chat. And I've been calling it NCRAWL. I don't know if that's correct. I'll find out soon enough. Um, it's also Global Astronomy Month, organized by the good folks at, a, at a Astronomers Without Borders. Uh, they have tons of different events that have gone on already. And there's even a few more going on uh, as April's Astronomy Month comes to a close. So you can find events on their site at astronomerswithoutborders.org. And the link will also, of course, be in the chat. Now, uh, this is related. Uh, the Globe at Night's uh, light pollution measurement campaign is on this week. So take a look at Leo and use their charts to determine the quality of skies where you're at and report back to Globe at Night via their website or app. And details are on their website, which is globeatnight.org. And that link is in the chat. And um, also extremely related to the previous two, it's also Dark International Dark Sky Week from the International Dark Sky Association. And you can find out more about light pollution and ways we can mitigate or eliminate it altogether on their site and for their events they're also having this week. If you've never seen a sky from a dark site, especially um, the Milky Way from a dark sky park, it's worth it if you can get there. Uh, for more info, go to idsw.darksky.org and where is that link? Can also be the chat. And um, that's pretty much it. But I just have to add, uh, if you wake up early tomorrow, you got a clear view of the eastern horizon. There's that, that line of planets going on. It looks great. It's going to be a special guest, the crescent moon. Um, it's hanging low below Venus, tonight's subject. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, and Saturn's somewhere off to the side there, a little ways away from Mars. And that is courtesy Earth Sky and John Goss. So I don't know. I just thought of Venus. Check it out. And that's it for me. Uh, oh, back right. to you, Brian. Thanks, Dave. I also want to mention that it's never too early to start planning for total solar eclipses. We are under two years from the uh, 2024 total eclipse and about a year and a half from the annular eclipse. And I hope Vivian might uh, give a little mention about the program that we're doing. And uh, hopefully she can find the link for uh, you can sign up to get more information at some point. So Vivian, do you got anything to say? 
Oh, we'll give a little teaser. We're really excited. Uh, we just got funded to um, lead a project called Eclipse Ambassadors Off the Paths. So if you are from somewhere that's not on the path of totality or annularity coming up, um, or even if you are and might not be there for the eclipses, we encourage you, we'll, you'll get plenty of information from us soon to sign up to become an Eclipse Ambassador. I'll stick that in the chat in just a minute. Um, we'll partner amateur astronomers and undergraduate students to prepare their communities in advance of the eclipses. We're really, really excited to have you participate and we'll get you plenty of information in no time flat. All right, thank you, Vivian. So for those of you on Zoom, you can find the chat window and the Q&A window you're generally at the bottom edge of the Zoom window on your desktop. Please feel free to greet each other in the chat window or to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. You can also send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. If you have a question you would like our guest speaker to answer, please type it into the Q&A window and uh, we'll keep the chat for just chatting. And also uh, speaking of the chat, make sure that you select everyone and uh, because it defaults to just uh, host and panelists. Okay, I'm gonna hit the record here for the... Okay, welcome to the April webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Colby Ostberg to our webinar. Colby is currently a fourth year PhD student at the University of California in Riverside. He received his BS in physics at San Francisco State University before jo joining Dr. Stephen Kane at UCR. Since his arrival there, he's been immersed in studying all things Venus. They published a paper in 2019, which predicted the number of potential exo-Venuses that the terrestrial exoplanet survey satellite, otherwise known as TESS, would discover. Since then, he's focused his attention on the transmission spectra of exovenuses, which will allow the opportunity to estimate the atmospheric composition of these planets. And so please welcome Kobe Ostberg. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I guess I can go ahead and share my screen. Cool. Looks great. Awesome. Uh, and let me just get set up with the presenter view. Okay. So uh, again, thank you for uh, having me here to uh, preach the Venus gospel. Um, I'm very excited. I have been studying Venus for quite a while now. And uh, I love being able to, uh, you know, tell people how cool it is because it is typically portrayed as not being cool at all. So uh, let's just go ahead and get into it. Um, of course, before I start, a little bit about me. He already mentioned some of this, but uh, I'm a fourth, fourth year PhD student at Riverside. And uh, I did my undergrad at SF State, which is pretty close to where your um, community is based. So that is awesome. Um, I love San Francisco and I miss it there. It's definitely not as cool down here in Riverside. Uh, not really much going on, just a lot of desert and smoldering heat, which is soon coming as we are near the summer. Um, but yeah, so I did my undergrad in physics and I definitely enjoyed it. But I just came to the understanding that the amount of <laughs> math that you had to do to actually have a career in physics was just too much for me. I was talking to a lot of graduate students who were doing like their master's at SF State while I was there and just seeing the things that they had to do for their master's in physics, it just sounded awful. Um, and uh, Stephen Kane, which is my current advisor, was actually a professor at SF State, and I took an exoplanets course with him, and after taking that course, I realized that exoplanets are amazing, and I decided to pursue it. That's why I'm here now. Uh, so I'm very lucky that he was there at SF State. And so since I've gotten here, I've pretty much been doing all things Venus. Um, 
we, as uh, Brian mentioned, I published a paper with Stephen Kane, and it was either 2020 or 2019. I honestly do not remember. But that paper just focused on predicting the amount of exovenous exovenuses that the test mission um, would be discovering throughout its lifetime. And I did a little stint with um, Sue Smirkar at JPL, and she is amazing. She is the, I think the deputy PI on the Mars InSight mission, and I think the lead PI on one of the new Venus missions, Veritas. And um, so when I was with her at JPL, we were doing a lot of Venus geology, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so I've been doing, you know, exo Venuses and also Venus here and the geology aspect of it. So I've been really uh, just trying to round out my skill set and the things that I know about Venus. Um, since the, the paper that I put out, I've been focusing mainly on transmission spectra, which is uh, basically the, the main tool that we, we will have for determining the composition of the atmospheres of exoplanets. And I'll go into more detail about that as well. Um, for those that are not aware, let me just go over some of the cool facts about Venus. Um, so Venus is extremely hot. And this is one of the reasons that people tend to ignore it just because, you know, oh, it's way too hot for life to exist on the surface. Therefore, we should not care about it. But that is wrong. We should definitely care about it. Uh, one of the, and so one cool fact about the surface temperature is uh, that if you were to take a frozen pizza out while you were on the surface of Venus, the pizza would cook in 10 seconds because it is that hot. So if you ever need to quickly cook a pizza because of an emergency, then the best thing to do is to take your pizza to Venus. Um, Besides the extremely hot temperatures, it only gets worse. There's also an extremely high uh, amount of surface pressure, which is mainly due to the extremely thick atmosphere. And so just to, um, so the surface pressure is 92 bars. And just to put that into perspective, you know, here on earth, we are at one bar at the surface. And um, so 92 bars would be the equivalent of going almost a kilometer deep into the ocean. So the weight of the ocean and the atmosphere on top of you when you're 900 meters deep is the same as being on the surface of Venus. So that doesn't sound like a good time. Uh, Venus is completely covered in clouds. So, you know, here on Earth, clouds are uh, variable and, you know, they're never covering the entire planet at once. On a Venus, that is not the case. And so uh, this is why Venus is able to stay so hot because of the greenhouse effect that occurs. And um, so uh, those clouds are composed of mainly sulfuric acid and water. And so not only would you be crushed by the atmosphere and uh, pretty much melted by the high temperatures, you would also be dissolved by the acid that consists or uh, that is in the atmosphere. So it's just not, not a good time on the surface of Venus. Uh, Venus is also kind of weird just because it is rotating in the opposite direction of all the other planets, other than Uranus, of course, which is on its axis. And it rotates very, very slowly. Um, it, its rotation is almost the same as its orbital period. So it is almost what we call tidally locked. And uh, yeah, so this is weird. And there's some speculation as to uh, there's some speculation that this rotation rate is responsible for uh, the environment that we see today. Also, a weird thing is that, or I guess not weird, but in the past when we couldn't see through the atmosphere or know what's going on in the surface of Venus, we believed that it was actually a swamp planet. And there uh, is a bunch of old science fiction movies that are pretty terrible, but uh, cool nonetheless that depicts going to Venus and seeing uh, like dinosaurs walking on its surface and things like that. Um, but once we were able to actually, you know, see the temperature uh, of the atmosphere and down to the surface, then we realized that, okay, well, it's not a jungle planet. Uh, and so why should you care about Venus? As I explained, it is um, pretty terrible, not for us, but it is a very, very interesting planet 
And um, one of the reasons that it is particularly interesting is that work has been done recently that showed that Venus could have had a extended period of having temperate surface temperatures. And if anyone's interested, the paper is by Michael Way in 2020. And basically with the, with the right starting conditions when the planet forms, um, Venus could have you know, sustained a livable climate for up to a billion years ago. Uh, and of course there's factors, a bunch of factors that you know, could affect whether it would have had water in the beginning to help sustain that temperature or not. But um, the model that uh, Michael Way ran showed that it is possible. We do not know for sure, and it'll be very difficult to actually determine that it was habitable, but the possibility of it is very, very intriguing. Another thing that people tend to forget is that Venus is the most physically similar planet to Earth. Um, Mars is the one that gets all the attention by NASA and other agencies. It gets all the cool rovers, all the latest technology, and Venus doesn't get squat. Um, but it shouldn't just get squat because it is extremely similar to Earth. Uh, it has, I believe, 90%, uh, a radius that is 90% that of the Earth's radius, and its mass is about 85% that of Earth, whereas Mars is very, very small. And so the fact that they're so similar makes it even more intriguing as to why are they so different now. And this is why Venus is very important in the search for life in the universe and understanding how planets become habitable is because um, you know what what happened to it if it was similar or since it is similar to earth uh, you know what exactly was the tipping point that caused it to diverge from earth's evolution so drastically and these are things that um, are currently being looked into and things that the new missions which i mentioned down below will really help us uh, investigate. And so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, uh, the new missions that have, are being planned or they have been accepted by NASA are the Da Vinci and Veritas missions. And there's also a uh, sequel to the Venera uh, spacecrafts that were sent to Venus a long time ago by the Russians and that is called Venera D. And there's also a ESA, which is the European Space Agency. They are also sending a mission to Venus. And um, <clears throat> so Venus is becoming uh, pretty popular, which is fantastic. And these new missions will be you know, extremely helpful for understanding what happened to it. And of course, there's a lot that we still don't know. <laughs> and I'll, I'll get into that, of course. <clears throat> so uh, just a little breakdown of you know, what we have sent to Venus from Earth. Um, probably the most famous missions have been the Venera missions. And that is primarily because they were able to take pictures of the surface. Um, but there was also, uh, you know, Mariner, Pioneer Venus, Magellan, which is, I'm a, which I'm gonna go into a decent amount. And the latest ones were Venus Express and Akatsuki, which is a Japanese space agency mission. But since Akatsuki, Venus has received nothing except for loneliness and neglect. And, you know, it's quite sad. But with these new missions, uh, we will definitely be spoiling it. And it, hopefully it'll make up for all the lost time that uh, we were not investigating it. So just to go a little bit more in depth about some of the missions that I mentioned. So the Venera missions were, uh, I think there was like 12 or 13 of them were uh, spacecraft that were sent to Venus by the Russians. And Venera 3 was actually the first uh, human object to reach another planet's surface, which was awesome. And it was actually the first to take a picture of another planet's surface from the surface. So a pretty um, you know, benchmark mission. And on its descent, it was able to take measurements of the pressure and temperature on Venus, as well as things like wind speeds. And um, <clears throat> there's a funny little anecdote. So uh, I don't remember which of the 12 or 13 Venera missions it was, but on one of these spacecrafts, they had a device that 
was designed to measure the compressibility of Venus's surface. And from those measurements, I think they can determine um, like the composition of the surface and how dense it is, and things like that. Uh, and they also had a camera to take pictures. And so the camera needs to be protected as it is descending. And so they have a cap that goes over the camera. <clears throat> and uh, so the uh, cap needs to be ejected and with force because the atmosphere is so thick that it, you know, it takes a lot of force to actually move things. And so uh, it ejected properly, but it happened to land directly under the spots where the um, device was uh, going to measure the compressibility. And so the device uh, sent back data and it returned the compressibility of the lens cap <clears throat> instead of Venus's surface. So I'm sure that was extremely frustrating for people who spent years of their life, you know, designing this mission, but you know, it's hard to make sure everything goes correct when you are, uh, you know, having things happen on a different planet. Then there was uh, Pioneer, which uh, was able to measure uh, the composition and temperature of the upper atmosphere, as well as the plasma environment in the ionosphere of Venus. And it consisted of a orbiter and four probes that were able to, um, again, measure important things like the uh, composition of the clouds and the pressure and temperature deeper into the atmosphere. And I found this really cool. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if it was from the same era or not, but this really cool like poster for Pioneer. And I, I really, really love this, this photo. Now for Magellan. And so I uh, used basically only Magellan data when I was working with Sue Smirkar. And so Magellan was an orbiter that uh, did a fantastic job of taking a, uh, images of the surface as well as uh, measuring the topography or just like the height of different uh, geological features on, on Venus. And to this day, or I guess uh, you, you may wonder, you know, why am I using this 30 plus year old data to study Venus's surface? Well, it's because that's all we have. Um, there has not been any update <laughs> to, to, this, uh, to this data that we got from Magellan. And um, so, you know, is it, it was a 30 or the mission was 30 plus years ago. And so therefore the devices used to get the data were also 30 plus years old. And uh, so that means the resolution of the measurements that it took was not very good in comparison to today's standards. And so just to put it in perspective, um, if you were to map Earth's surface with the Magellan Orbiter, you would not be able to resolve the uh, San Andreas Fault uh, because the resolution is that bad. And that is a important detail to miss because the San Andreas Fault is a clear indicator that there are tectonic plates on, on Earth. And um, so with the new missions, I believe Veritas is going to be redoing this thing that Magellan did. With, with the new data, you know, there could be a lot of stuff that we discovered that we just missed out on because of how bad the resolution was. But I know I was uh, hating on it a lot, but we still learned a lot from this mission. Um, there is possible evidence of subduction on Venus's surface. So in that top right figure, we are looking at the, the topography uh, of a feature called a corona on Venus. And so red is indicating higher topography and green is lower topography. And so there is like this trench around this corona and this cor coronas are just like circular features that are all over Venus's surface. And uh, so the uh, trench on the outside is potentially where a uh, part of the crust went underneath a different part of the crust, which is essentially what subduction is. And so that is really, really, <laughs> uh, or if that is actually subduction, then that can help us understand a lot about Venus's history because on Earth, subduction is uh, vital for recycling carbon from the atmosphere in, back into the interior. 
So subduction allows us to keep our carbon levels, uh, you know, re relatively low. And um, that's why, you know, global warming is, or climate change is a thing because we are speeding up that process of putting that CO2 back into the atmosphere. And so the subduction is not quick enough to account for how much we're putting out. Uh, I guess, lastly, uh, another thing that Magellan discovered is that there are very few craters on the surface of Venus. And so we use craters or the number of craters on the surface of a planet or moon to date the age of its surface. And so when we dated the age of Venus's surface, the crater showed that the surface is around a billion years old, which doesn't really make too much sense um, just because there isn't really any erosion going on on Venus's surface. And so the hypothesis that was used to uh, account for this is that there was a catastrophic resurfacing event where the, a billion years ago, the entire surface was covered in lava, which then, you know, uh, covered up the craters that we should be seeing to, because uh, the craters should, you know, reflect that the planet is, you know, 4 billion years old or whatever. And so this theory is really dramatic and uh, it is only a, or I guess it would be a hypothesis, uh, it is only a hypothesis, and um, there are other, you know, different things that have been brought up that could answer the same question, but uh, the catastrophic resurfacing is accepted by some of the community, but it sounds really crazy, <laughs> and it would have been crazy to witness. And lastly, uh, let's talk a little bit about Akatsuki. So this was a Japanese space agency mission. And honestly, I don't know too much about the science that they have done. Uh, I know that's it has a strong emphasis on studying the clouds on Venus. And so this is one of the, the cooler features that they have found. And so you can see this like bulge um, in the middle of Venus here. And so that is essentially a gravity wave that is traveling through the atmosphere and creating this crazy bulge that we see here. And uh, the scale of this is crazy, it's like, I think it's like 6,000 miles wide or something. Uh, I guess that would be vertically. And uh, so, yeah, so there's like really crazy things going on in the atmosphere on Venus that we, you know, would not be used to here on Earth. And another thing that Koski has become famous for is it's really amazing photos of Venus. So these aren't in the visible spectrum. So if you were in space looking at Venus, it wouldn't look quite like this. Um, they are using filters to uh, look at different structures of the cloud. So uh, it's either in like the ultraviolet or in the infrared that you're seeing this, but these are really, really awesome photos uh, that they have of Venus. So despite all these missions, there is still a ton of things that we just do not know about Venus. Um, <clears throat> so just to list a few, we don't really know what the structure of the interior is, you know, here on Earth. Uh, we have, you know, the core, mantle, and the crust, but we don't know if that's the same on Venus, uh, as well as what it is composed of. And the interior is very important because the interior of planets is what generates a magnetic field. And on Earth, the magnetic field is very important for deflecting solar wind and protecting our atmosphere. And Venus does not have a magnetic field. So uh, we would like to know if it did in the past. And so learning more about the interior would help with that. Plate tectonics, as I mentioned, super, super important for recycling carbon. Uh, for uh, in the moment, we uh, say that Venus has a stagnant lid. And so that is basically the, the uh, crust is one thick or one complete plate. Whereas on earth, you know, we have plates that are moving tectonic plates. And so um, the thing, the possible signs of subduction kind of hint to, you know, there might be some form of tectonics on Venus, but we really do not know. Also the, <clears throat> the water loss history, we would like to know whether Venus had water or not. And uh, the D to H, so that is D for deuterium and uh, H for hydrogen. So it's the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. And basically the, the ratio of the, those two elements in the atmosphere can help us understand how much water did Venus have in the past. Uh, but we, we don't really have any good measurements on that because all the measurements of that were taken uh, by the older missions 
and the uncertainties are very high. So we can't really learn too much from them in the moment. Uh, was Venus habitable in the past? If it was, how long was it habitable? And what caused it to be completely uninhabitable to life as we know it uh, today? And so the ways that we are going about trying to solve these mysteries is either through in situ missions, so missions that go to Venus and take data from the planet itself, or uh, which I will be talking mostly about today, the study of exoplanets. Um, and so the in situ missions, as I mentioned before, there's four new missions that are coming out and uh, that will ask, that'll help answer, you know, some of the direct questions about Venus that we have. Whereas the study of exoplanets is kind of like an indirect pathway to, to learning about Venus. And uh, so we are interested in planets, and this is primarily what I have been working on, is planets that are in the Venus zone, which I will be defining uh, in a couple slides. And so when we discover a planet that might be Venus-like, the way we can learn about those planets is by observing their atmospheres through different techniques that, again, I will define later. Um, and so these uh, planets are you know, really important for understanding Venus, even though you know, they may not be exactly like Venus, because we want to try and whittle down you know, what were the main causes that made Venus the way it is today. And so you know, Venus receives a lot more energy from the sun than we do. So that is one potential factor. And so what we could do is find a rocky planet that receives a similar amount of um, energy from its star that Venus does, which I think is around two times the amount that the Earth receives. So we find a planet that has two times the amount of uh, flux in the Earth. And if we find that, you know, that planet may be able to sustain a habitable atmosphere, if we find that it has, um, you know, water, then, you know, it help, it bodes well for the theory that Venus could have been habitable in the past. Um, and so we can use exoplanets to basically like confirm things that we are wondering about Venus here. All right, so let's get into how exactly we discover exoplanets. So the main method that is used today to discover uh, exoplanets is called uh, the transit method or transit detection. And so with this method, basically what we are doing is looking at a star and we are basically they just have, if, if you don't know that there's a planet there, they'll just point a telescope at a star. And if while it is looking at the star, we see the brightness of that star drop, then we know that something is passing in front of it. Um, and based on how much that brightness drops, the amount that it drops, we can then determine what the size of the planet is in comparison to the star. And um, since, you know, uh, there is like a limit on how small of things that we can detect, uh, there is, um, this method is more sensitive towards larger planets, but it also helps if the star is a lot smaller. And so, um, a lot of the missions recently, like TESS and Kepler, which I, want to, or I hope some of y'all have heard about, um, they have been using this technique and they've been looking at a lot of really small stars and they've been finding a lot of rocky planets, rocky planets transiting in front of their stars. Uh, this method is also more sensitive to planets with shorter orbital periods. So our solar system is very weird because it is very spread out, but when we are looking at a lot of cooler stars, the systems uh, around those stars tend to be a lot more compact and have a lot shorter orbital periods. And the reason that it is more sensitive to these shorter orbital periods is mainly because the chances of actually detecting or seeing the thing, the planet pass in front of the star is a lot higher because it passes in front of the star more often. Uh, and so if you were to try and look at, uh, let's say like the earth, um, from if we, if we were looking at a completely uh, analogous system to ours, we would only see the Earth transit once every 365 days. And so the chances of actually seeing it transits when you are looking at that star is very, very low. Um, 
And so, as I mentioned, this method uh, is, prim is used primarily by the test mission. And so TEST stands for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And uh, this mission was launched in 2018. And it has basically been surveying the entire sky and seeing if planets are transiting in front of stars. And it has been doing a very, very good job. Um, in particular, it has been finding a lot of planets that are in the Venus zone, which I will explain in the next slide. Uh, and one thing that is great about TESS is that it is observing stars that are nearby and therefore a lot more or very bright. Um, the mission that TESS was the predecessor, for, I don't know if predecessor is the right word, the mission that came before TESS was called Kepler. And it did a similar thing. It stared at a single point of the sky looking for transiting planets, but the stars it was looking at were very far away and therefore very faint. And uh, it is easier to um, learn about exoplanets when they are around a brighter star. So it is very good that Tess is looking at nearby stars. Uh, and yeah, so let me explain the Venus zone. So the Venus zone is basically a first order S, or we use it as a first order estimate to determine whether a planet is Venus-like. Excuse me. And so this is a very busy plot. So let me just try and explain it. So on the y-axis is the uh, effective temperature of the star. I believe the sun is around like 57, 5,700 degrees Kelvin. So um, it would be you know, in the middle and you see Venus, Earth, and Mars here. And on the x-axis is the percentage of starlight that the planet is receiving relative to Earth. Uh, and this is a log scale on, on the bottom. And so um, you can see Earth here is at 100% uh, on the x-axis and the y-axis is the temperature for the, for the sun. Um, but these, these shaded regions here, the red is the Venus zone and in the blue is the habitable zone. And essentially the habitable zone is the region around a star where the amount of energy that the planet receives uh, could allow it to sustain liquid water on the surface, given that the planet has sufficient atmospheric pressure. <clears throat> and so, the, you know, that's a very vague description, um, but it is really, it's not saying for sure that, you know, if a planet is in the habitable zone, that it is for sure habitable. Uh, it is pretty much just a selection tool to help us uh, locate planets of interest. And so the Venus zone is similar. Um, the outer boundary, so the, the blue boundary that is shared with the habitable zone, that is the runaway greenhouse boundary. And at that boundary, basically the amount of flux that a planet would receive um, at the boundary would be enough to prevent it from having uh, liquid surface water on its surface. And so um, because just because the energy would receive would make it too hot to sustain liquid water. And the inner boundary, so the boundary on the left, the dotted line, that is essentially uh, how hot a Venus-like planet could get before it starts losing all of its atmosphere. So with that in mind, with those boundaries in mind, planets in the Venus zone should not have any liquid surface water, but should still have sufficient or a uh, prominent atmosphere. Um, and so with this, we basically can uh, determine whether a planet could potentially be an exo-Venus. Uh, the other thing that is important, of course, is that the planet is rocky. And so the, the limit kind of, it's, it's kind of fuzzy, but the, the limit for how big a planet can get before it turns gaseous is around two times the radius of Earth. So we are interested in planets that are in the Venus zone uh, and less than two times the size of Earth. Um, and so this is a, sorry again for uh, another plot, but this is basically the same plot. We have the flux, which is just the amount of energy that a planet receives on the x-axis here. And on the y-axis again is the temperature of the star. The dotted lines are for the inner and the outer uh, Venus zone boundaries. And um, this is showing discovered known planets. 
and they're just color coded based on their uh, their radius. And so if we just focus on the red, so those are all planets with radii less than 1.5 times the radius of Earth. Uh, there is a lot, <laughs> there is a lot of planets that are in this Venus zone. And so that is great. Um, you know, we, it is nice that we have a large sample size so that we can, uh, you know, have observations of their atmospheres that I'll get into um, to determine potentially a composition. But in general, there is a lot of planets that could potentially be like Venus. But how do we determine, you know, the actual climates or surface conditions of these planets? Well, that's where the James Webb Space Telescope comes into play. Um, you know, this telescope was recently launched and uh, thank God it launched safely and got, got to uh, its location or its destination safely because, you know, it was a long time coming. But uh, the JWC will be able to do a lot of things for a lot of different fields, but in particular for exoplanets, its primary use will be for conducting transmission and emission spectroscopy. And uh, essentially with these techniques, we are determining the composition of the atmosphere of planets. Um, and the, for anyone then that's interested, the wavelength range is in the near infrared, which is around uh, one to 25 microns. And so just a little visual on what transmission spectroscopy is. Uh, I include this little figure. So this requires a planet to transit, uh, which again is when the planet passes in front of uh, us and the star. And so when the, <clears throat> the light from the star goes through the atmosphere of the planet, it interacts with the molecules in the atmosphere. And uh, molecules kind of have like a, a fingerprint um, where they will absorb light but at different frequency or different wavelengths for each molecule. And so when that starlight passes through the atmosphere and gets to us, we can uh, basically look at all the different wavelengths of light that we are receiving. And if some of that light is missing, um, then we know that you know, a molecule, a, a species in the atmosphere of the planet absorbed or scattered that molecule. And again, based on the wavelength that it was absorbed at, we can determine what kind of uh, molecules are in the atmosphere. Uh, and you can all the, also do this um, when the planet is behind the star, but it's just a little bit different because it is reflecting light instead of the light passing through the atmosphere. But uh, this will be um, the, the primary method of us determining the composition of planets. Uh, but unfortunately, it will not be easy <laughs> to actually learn things about exovenuses in particular. <clears throat> um, we have actually done this before, this uh, trans, uh, spectroscopy of planets, um, but uh, pr primarily with giant planets in other systems. Um, and that is because the planet is bigger, there is more light that is being absorbed because it has a much thicker atmosphere. Um, and when, when I say giant, I'm talking about like Jupiter, like planets, just completely gaseous. And so there's a lot more absorption going on there. And uh, so that, that kind of stuff was actually done with Hubble, but Hubble didn't have the sensitivity needed to do it with terrestrial rocky planets. Um, and James Webb will have the capability, but with Venuses, it can actually get uh, a little complicated. And so I apologize, this is an extremely busy plot, but this is an example of what um, transmission, a transmission spectra of a Venus-like planet would look like. And so the y-axis is basically the, uh, the opaqueness of the atmosphere. And um, on the x-axis is the wavelength that the atmosphere is opaque. And so as I mentioned before, you know, each molecule has a specific uh, absorption fingerprint. And so CO2, which is the primary um, molecule in Venus's atmosphere, uh, absorbs at these wavelengths here, which is 2 microns, 2.7, and 4.3. And so with a Venus-like planet, we would expect there to be a ton of absorption at 
uh, these wavelengths because there would be a lot of CO2 and the CO2 would be absorbing the light. And so that's what we're seeing here. So these peaks are all absorption from CO2. Um, but what I also did, uh, and probably did 20 times because it makes it look more complicated, but I uh, adjusted the height of the clouds in the atmosphere. And so Venus has clouds that go up to 120 kilometers and cover the entire planet. Um, and so clouds are terrible for doing transmission spectra. Um, they basically block all of the light, whereas you know uh, molecules only block certain wavelengths. And so they prevent us from learning a lot about planets. And so uh, let's only just for now focus on this yellow line. So this is a uh, tra this, the transmission spectrum with the clouds at the highest point uh, of this planet or in the atmosphere of this planet um, that this is based off of. And so when the clouds are this high, you are basically missing out on all the information that is in the other lines below it. Um, so basically, uh, it shrinks the size of the CO2 features and then any smaller features that the clouds are blocking, we also don't get to see at all. And so in general, um, clouds will prevent us from learning things about exoplanets. Um, and so another thing that's a problem is that Earth has a pretty similar transmission spectrum uh, to Venus. So this is kind of the same thing we're just looking at, but now I threw in Earth's transmission spectra in the red. And it's pretty puzzling because, you know, Venus has uh, like a hundred times as much or more than that. Venus's atmosphere is extremely thick and has 96% CO2. Earth has, I think, like 0.004% CO2 and it's much thinner. So you would expect Venus to have a lot more CO2 absorption um, but since the clouds are there, it negates a lot of that absorption and uh, it actually makes it seem like Earth has more CO2. And so this is another problem that we might encounter when looking at uh, exoplanets. Um, the, we might not be able to differentiate a uh, Earth from a Venus. I'm gonna try and speed through here because I'm a little behind. Um, and so uh, the next question is, you know, can James Webb actually detect an exo-Venus? And um, so the, the simple answer is probably not. Um, this, this plot here is showing the, the same spectra in black that we're just looking at, but in red is simulated James Webb data. And um, pretty much it just doesn't matter how many times uh, we uh, observe a Venus-like planet just because the features are so small that we would just never be able to differentiate it from a planet just not having an atmosphere at all. And um, so this sucks. <laughs> um, but you know the, the, the thing is, we don't really know what we will encounter when we are observing exoplanets. This is for an exact Venus analog. But in reality, you know, uh, the atmospheres of planets in the Venus zone could be a lot different um, than what we see on Venus today. So uh, it is yet to be seen how we will actually be able to, how well we'll be, be able to determine the atmosphere, sorry, determine the atmospheric composition of exoplanets. Okay, um, so after we get the spectra, the main thing will be determining the climates of the uh, planets from just looking at their atmosphere. And um, so as we saw, you know, the, the clouds can prevent us from uh, seeing the molecules in majority of the atmosphere. And so one of the challenges is determining the surface conditions on a planet just from observing the very top of its atmosphere. And that's where in-situ missions come into play because um, we need uh, to determine the climate of an exoplanet, we model it using a climate model. Uh, and the information that we put into those climate models will just be the information that we learn from their atmospheres. And so the more that we understand the connection between the uh, surface conditions and what's going on at the top of the atmosphere, the better we'd be able to model the climates of exoplanets um, from our observations. And one of the missions that will be helping us improve these models is DaVinci. 
Um, it was recently accepted and it's awesome. It's the, it, its main goals will be to determine whether there was water ever on Venus and um, as well as just improving the general data that we have because uh, the data that we currently have for Venus, again, is very old because it's all from those older emissions. And so the uncertainties are a lot higher and with the new data, we'll be able to get a more firm understanding of the structure of Venus's atmosphere. And uh, I'm going to show a quick video uh, just because this video will probably do a better job at explaining it than I will. So uh, enjoy, it's only a minute long. On the hottest planet in the solar system, a probe descends through a thick poisonous atmosphere. It is both a time capsule and time machine unlocking secrets of the ancient past while revealing how a world can turn from possibly habitable to horrible. The location? Venus. Our sister planet has much to tell us about our own and exoplanets, helping ignite a scientific renaissance for our universe. The mission, brought to you by NASA Goddard and its partners, is aptly named Da Vinci Plus, the first U.S. probe mission to Venus in over 40 years. With the probe acting as chemistry lab and photographer, other cameras will map and gather additional views of the planet from above, providing a new study of Venus that has scientific implications well beyond our own solar system. Da Vinci Plus will give us a new understanding of planetary evolution. Launching in 2029, three years will be spent exploring our celestial neighbor, Da Vinci Plus, coming soon to a planet near you. So yeah, that, <laughs> I, I think that video is so cool. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that is a general idea of, of Da Vinci. Um, it will have you know, a probe and an orbiter. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have too much time because I spent a little bit too much time in the background stuff, but it is all good. But the main questions it will answer is, uh, did the inner planets form the same materials? Did Venus have water ever? Um, did Venus have uh, continents in the past, which is kind of a sign of plate tectonics and things like that. Uh, let me see what else I could put in here. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, it will have a, um, a probe that will just fall down onto the surface. It will most likely not survive the landing and it is not planned to, but on its way down, it'll be taking in measurements of the atmosphere. And just to get an idea of what it'll be doing, um, missions in the past, pretty much, uh, were only able to measure the or uh, investigate the top of the atmosphere and a little bit of the middle of the atmosphere you see there with the Vega balloons and Pioneer. But uh, Da Vinci will be a complete measurement from about 70 kilometers down to the surface. And the surface, uh, the atmosphere near the surface, we really do not know that much about. So Da Vinci will be unveiling what is going on down there. Um, and so, uh, yes, it'll help us understand, you know, there could have been two habitable planets in the solar system, which is a game changer because uh, we all have been, you know, living our lives with the understanding that Earth is special and the only one. Um, and I'm just going to wrap it up there. Uh, sorry, I rushed it a little bit at the end there. Um, but in summary, Venus is more important than it is given credit for. Uh, Exoplanets will be a you know alternative path to understanding Venus and um, looking into the possibility of it being habitable in the past. And in situ measurements uh, will be complementary to that of the exoplanet studies, and will help improve our models that we use to uh, model the climates on Venus-like planets. And um, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate y'all for having me, and thank you all for listening. All right. Thank you, Colby. That's really, really fascinating. And, and uh, you know, gosh, it sounds like an exciting mission. And, and I love the fact that, it, that, you know, looking beyond can help understand what's here. But, uh, you know, then there's a synergy between the near and the far um, with this mission. And it's, it's great. So Robert asks a question, wouldn't Venus's atmosphere cause extensive erosion with all that acid and other things in it? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Um, so there is weathering 
uh, I think it's you know specifically chemical weathering when the atmosphere interacts with the surface, but um, it is not to the same effect as you know erosion from water. Um, like the you know the chemical weathering won't be making a Grand Canyon on Venus. Uh, you know water has a much more potent erosion effect than that, um, and so that is why we um, we the the chemical weathering wouldn't be responsible for the the lack of craters that we saw. Um, that's why they they use that catastrophic resurfacing to explain it. But good good question. Okay, and um, you might go ahead and stop screen share since you just have the uh, yep. the last slide there. Great. Uh, so Mary asks, will the Da Vinci probe, and I think you alluded to this, and the, will the Da Vinci probe be able to take any images once it lands on the surface if it survives the trip to the surface? So what are the imaging capabilities of uh, the probe all the way down? Yeah, so again, great question. Um, so it will be taking images, but not from the surface. Uh, what it will be doing instead is taking images of the surface below as it is descending towards the surface. And the reason that they wanted to do that is because they wanted to see if there are any ties between the um, surface features or the geology below the atmosphere that they're taking the measurements in. So they'll be taking hundreds of images uh, as it falls. But I think once it hits the surface, uh, they aren't planning on doing anything there. All right. Okay, Bill asks, or will either uh, in situ or exoplanet investigations look at the effects of magnetospheres, especially on the existence or absence of atmospheres? So I guess uh, what's the relationship between uh, atmospheres and uh, magnetic fields? Is, so uh, hopefully I got that right, Bill, so you can correct us if, uh, if, if we didn't. So... so uh, that is actually a pretty deep rabbit hole, uh, especially as of recently. So, uh, you know, it, it is predominantly thought of that ab or magnetic fields are essential for a planet, you know, maintaining an atmosphere. And it does, you know, protect us from the um, charged stellar winds, which when interacting with our atmosphere can send uh, molecules in our atmosphere flying to space, and over time, you know, we would lose our atmosphere. But Venus does not have an atmosphere, does not have a magnetic field. And so the thought of a magnetic field being necessary kind of doesn't work when it comes to Venus, because Venus has the thickest atmosphere out of all the terrestrial planets. And uh, so it is actually unknown whether magnetic fields uh, help or hurt planets. Um, because at the poles, it actually, the magnetic fields actually like funnel stellar wind at the poles. And that's why we see, you know, aurora. Um, and so that's yeah, in the solar system. With exoplanets, all I know is it will be extremely difficult. And at least in the near future, it'll, we probably won't be able to determine the presence of a magnetic field on an exoplanet. Um, there are ways hypothesized with viewing aurora on giant planets, um, but with our current sensitivity, it, is, it would be very, very hard. So it, it makes me think a little bit because I know that, that that's was one of the, the areas of investigation on Mars. And that was one of the things that MAVEN went was to investigate the, the you know, lack of atmosphere on Mars. And a lot of it had to do with the magnetic field, but it also there were, there were some other implications, which uh, I don't know whether that would have anything to do with, with Venus. Uh, you know, I think it was the solar wind stripping the, uh, um, the atmosphere away. And any, you know, synergy with uh, any findings there, does that inform anything? Um, well, Maven, Maven is a great mission. Um, it's hard to directly connect it to just because one of the uh, primary factors of a planet sustaining an atmosphere is its mass. Uh, and, you know, the more the mass, the stronger the gravity, and therefore the stronger its ability, or the stronger it can hold on to the molecules in its atmosphere. Um, so Mars is not very massive at all. And so it loses its atmosphere pretty easily. Uh, whereas Venus is near the mass of Earth, and so it has an easier time. But another thing is uh, basically when, it, when 
molecules escape a planet's atmosphere into space, the reason they are doing so is because they are energized to where they are fast enough to exceed the escape velocity, which is basically how fast you need to go to leave a planet's gravity, a gravitational pull. And it is easier to accelerate uh, lighter molecules. And so one thing that is a factor for why Venus has been able to keep its atmosphere is it's primarily composed of CO2, which is a heavy molecule in comparison to uh, you know, hydrogen or nitrogen. Um, and so since it is composed of mainly heavy molecules, it is much harder to speed those up so that it can leave. Um, so hopefully that, that answers your question. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, you know, Cliff has a good question. And on the descent of the, of the probe, he, he's wondering about, uh, you know, a, a parachute or something to slow its descent down, or is it just kind of a direct, um, and then it hits at, you know, terminal velocity? Yeah, good question. Um, so no parachutes. From, I, I believe there's no parachute, but um, saying that there isn't, uh, they use a technique called arrow breaking, which is where they basically use the friction of the atmosphere to help decelerate the spacecraft. Um, and so this is used in a bunch of missions, whether it's an orbiter, sometimes they have like the, the satellite that's orbiting a planet dip into its atmosphere for a minute just to slow it down, just because of the, the, the friction that it has. And um, with Venus, it's probably actually a lot easier to aerobrake just because the atmosphere is so thick. Um, the, the terminal velocity on Earth is, you know, basically where the, uh, the, as fast as you can go in and, and the terminal velocity on Venus would be a lot slower, um, mainly because it has a thicker atmosphere and less gravity. So no, they won't be slowing it down, but uh, it won't be going too fast where they won't be able to take measurements, essentially. Okay, that was something you just uh, said that was interesting. This kind of leads into a question that Stuart asked, and, and it's about, you know, the, the interior of uh, Venus, which, um, you know, da Vinci isn't going to be able to say anything, but maybe you might say, he says, how solid is the surface to the core? Is it consistent in the sense we understand Earth's tectonics? But then I want to come back to something you just said. You said that the, even, that the gravity on Venus is a little bit less However, it's approximately the same size as Earth. And so that would seem to indicate that we do know something about the in interior of uh, Venus. Yeah, um, so we do know its average density for sure, um, just using its, this, its mass and its radius. Um, but uh, something, so the Earth produces a magnetic field because it has a liquid outer core and the convection in that liquid outer, outer core, which is basically just the, the, the soup of metals in the core moving, that uh, movement creates a uh, magnetic field. But over time, that liquid outer core solidifies. And um, so when it is no longer a liquid and it can't convect, that's when the magnetic field stops being produced. And so there's things like that that just using the average density we can't learn. Um, and specifically with magnetic fields, uh, there are ways to like check metals or rocks on the surface for like uh, kind of like a signature of past magnetic fields. Um, basically like the, the metals in a rock might be like polarized and the only way they, they may be polarized is from the presence of a past magnetic field. So there are things like that that we can use to uh, determine things uh, like a magnetic field, but um, yeah, we, we, we just don't really know too much just from average density. Yeah, if we could get down there with some uh, handheld magnetometers or something and determine the polarity, just like they uh, use that for the uh, spreading regions in the ocean floor back in the 60s. So, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to go for one last question here. We are a little bit past time. And so Jim Kay kind of brings up uh, one of the, the more popular things from um, a couple of years ago is that uh, there was uh, the discovery of phosphine in, in the atmosphere and, and some, you know, implications for the potential of, of life as its source. And so anything about that that you could, uh, you know, comment on? Yeah. Um, 
so just to be clear, you know, it is not currently a, uh, it, it is a heavy, super heavily debated topic. When that paper first came out about the detection of phosphine, um, you know, it got a lot of publicity and it's awesome that Venus was getting publicity because of it. But since then, there's been like, I think like four or five rebuttal papers in response to their, uh, their work to try and show why it's not the case. And um, obviously this is why science works is because, you know, there is uh, people that like to make sure that people's analysis is correct. Um, but it's, it's something that we really won't know until we go there. And uh, this detection was, uh, this detection occurred a good while after the missions were already conceptualized and all the different instruments were created. So I'm not positive as to whether they added instrumentation last minute to these missions to look for phosphine. Um, but I, I guess like personally, uh, I wouldn't, I'm not too confident in it. Uh, it is definitely, you know, a little far-fetched. I'm not saying it is impossible, um, but I think the best thing about that, the whole phosphine is just the added excitement about Venus. Um, and the potential that there could be life in the atmosphere. And there is life in the atmosphere uh, on Earth. So it, it is definitely not um, a impossibility, but I just wouldn't bank on it too much being true. All the more reason to go there and exactly. uh, more than once too. So let, you know, let's uh, make it a mission for us. So. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's all for tonight. Thank you so much for Col Colby for joining us this evening. This is wonderful. And thank you everyone for tuning in. So you can join us for our next webinar on Thursday, May 19th, when, when we welcome back Dr. Kelly Lippo from the Space Telescope Science Institute, who will share with us what we might expect from the release of the first images and the science return from the web telescope. So you can find an archive of these webinars in the Next Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features some additional resources and activities and a link to Colby's paper. You can also find these webinars on the Next Sky Network YouTube channel. And so keep looking up and we will see you next month. And we'll kind of hang here for just a, a few more minutes though. So.